Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Hillside Community Church of 100 Mile House, BC, Canada. For all of you who are from outside of our church family and listening in online, my name is Pastor Clint Lang, and I'm just really glad that you could join us for this, this wonderful Sunday, Palm Sunday, uh, March to 28th, 2021. Hard to believe that we're a week before Easter already in 2021, isn't it? Well, this week is going to be filled with all kinds of things. Um, for those of you in the 100 Mile House area, uh, the South Caribou Evangelical Pastors Association will be hosting an online Good Friday service. We'll be broadcasting more details as the week goes on here about that and how you can tune in. Um, but we will be gathering together on Good Friday and broadcasting that uh, live on YouTube and Facebook. So I'm just really glad that uh, we've got such a wonderful congregation. And uh, for all you guys out there, we've been waiting an awful long time to be able to meet in person because of all the regulations that are happening right now. And I know that it's wearying to a lot of us, but um, this particular Sunday, uh, we do have authority to have uh, drive-in services right now. So we're gonna have a drive-in service. And the reason why we're going outside rather than inside is because with the present restrictions, we could only have 20 people per service inside and it would have to be masked and there'd be no singing. So <laughs> we'd rather sing and we'd rather uh, praise the Lord in our cars than not be able to sing out uh, in a small number. So for that reason, we're gonna be having two Easter services next Sunday. One at 11 o'clock from 11 till 12 o'clock and the other one from one o'clock to two o'clock. Uh, you'll be able to register. Uh, there'll be a jot form being sent out by Facebook and by email and you can sign up that way or you can give my wife Virginia a call and her number is 250-706-5323 if you'd like to give her a call and pre-register for that. Uh, we're only taking 25 cars per service so make sure that you, uh, if you want to come to these services, that you uh, register ahead of time. Anyways, I'm just glad that you're able to join me today. And uh, it's a day that we can rejoice in the Lord. Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Easter. Well, let's just pray. And uh, we're going to ask the Lord to bless our service. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for each person that's tuning into this broadcast from different places uh, around our country and some even overseas. And Lord, I thank you for our church congregation and I pray that your protection would be upon each person. And Lord, today as we, uh, we give thanks to you for all that you are and all that you have done, God, I just pray that you'd bless your word. Lord, bless your word as we talk about your triumphant ent entry into Jerusalem and uh, what it means for us today. And I just pray for those that are tuning into this that may never have experienced a relationship with you. Jesus, that today would be the day that they uh, decide that they want to make you the Lord of their life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Palm Sunday. You might say that it's the advent of Easter. And it's the day that we remember and celebrate uh, Jesus entering into Jerusalem as the world's Savior and King. Hosanna in the highest heaven. That was the cry that came from the people. These Bible verses about Palm Sunday, uh, both prophecy and the actual event are the focus of my message today. And I pray that the Lord would speak to you through his word and encourage your hearts. And if you've never really understood the gospel today, I just pray that today would be the day that you open your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the prophet Zechariah spoke more about the Messiah than any other Old Testament prophet. Now, Zechariah was one of the exiled Jews who came back to the land of Israel with Ezra and Nehemiah during the time where the temple was rebuilt. The Jews who were exiled in Babylon had been set free by Cyrus of Persia and had now returned. So now Zechariah was a contemporary with the prophet Haggai. And these two prophets, they challenged and encouraged uh, the people to rebuild the temple and also to look for the fulfillment of God's promises and to return to the Lord. Now, in the first part of the book of Zechariah, 
The prophet reminds the people of how they had wandered away from the truth and rejected the former prophet's call to repentance. And as a result, they were exiled into the land of Babylon. Now, he calls them to return back to God with hearts that are, are willing to change. And the second half of this book focuses on how God, in the end, will repair what has been damaged by the people's rebellion against him. Now, this is going to happen when God sends a savior to the world, a Messiah, who would also be a king, a Messiah who would be their king. Zechariah 9, verses 9 and 10. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So we see here that God speaks through Zechariah, telling the people that he would be coming to them in a most unexpected way. There is much symbolism in this prophetic word that tells us about the character of their king. He would be righteous and victorious, yet he would be lowly. He would be coming to them as a king riding on the foal of a donkey or the colt of a donkey. What Zechariah is saying is that the messianic king to come would be a humble king, a king who would bring peace, who would proclaim peace, and who would also rule to the ends of the earth. Now, I, I'm sure that in the day that Zechariah was speaking these words, the Jews who were hearing his message were most likely puzzled. What kind of king comes riding on a donkey's colt? What kind of highly king is lowly? It's almost a paradox when you think about it. Other prophets before Zechariah gave a similar description of the coming Savior of Israel. Isaiah, for example, wrote that when the Messiah first appeared, the people would not recognize him as the king that he was and the savior that he would be. In fact, the people would have a hard time believing the predictions of the prophets. Isaiah chapter 53, well-known passage of scripture, says this, Who has believed our message and to whom has the Lord, arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot. And like a root out of dry ground, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. So this coming Messiah, although he would be a king, he would come to people in lowly circumstances. He would grow up as an ordinary boy without physical pomp and riches that you would normally associate with a king. Isaiah added that he would suffer and would be treated with contempt. Because of his lowly appearance and his humble attitude, many would not believe that he was the Messiah King that God had sent. Now let's advance time, 700 years in the case of Isaiah, and 500 years after Zechariah, where the angel Gabriel appears to a young lady named Mary, who was engaged to be married to her betrothed, Joseph, both of whom had come from the tribe of Judah and were of the house and lineage of King David. Now, the angel told Mary that although she was a virgin, she was going to have a miraculously conceived son, conceived by the Holy Spirit. And the angel said, he will be great and he will be called the son of the Most High God. You see, they had to go to Bethlehem as part of a Roman census that was taking place to register because this is where David's ancestors had settled. This is where David had been born and where King David had been crowned over Israel. Now, it was on this journey that Jesus took his first donkey ride. And I was reading the scripture and I thought, man, this is cool. See, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey but he also rode into Bethlehem on a donkey. You see, he took it while still inside of his mother Mary's womb. 
The ride was between Nazareth, where he was conceived, and where he was born in Bethlehem. And this is the first part of the miraculous fulfillment of the prophecy that Zechariah gave proclaiming, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. And he goes on to say that your king is coming to you on a donkey's colt. And when Mary and Joseph arrived, because the town was overcrowded and there was no room for them in the local inn, Jesus was born in a stable and was laid in an animal's feed trough. The great one <laughs> was born in the most humble of circumstances. He didn't come to earth uh, in the way that you would expect a king to come. His parents were poor, not to mention they were from Nazareth, an area not held in very high regard of the people of that day. Even Philip said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, yet the angels appeared to those shepherds on the hills surrounding Bethlehem, as recorded in Luke chapter 2, 9 to 12. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all of the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace on those whom his favor rests. So the incarnation of Jesus Christ was a reflection of God's character and heart. He came to the lowliest circumstances so that he could identify with everyone because he's the king of kings and he was born in a feed trough. He could be the savior for all men, a person with whom all men could identify. You see, he was the utmost example to us of how to approach and present ourselves before the Father. Proverbs chapter 29 verse 23 tells us that pride brings a person low, but the lowly in spirit gain honor. So Christ grew and he gained honor. We know that Jesus was the most humble of all who have lived on earth, even though he was and is also God. But for our sake, he humbled himself. And because of his humble state, he was given the highest honor that can be given. He completely fulfills the picture of the Messiah as painted in the scriptures by Isaiah and Zechariah the prophets. Now, when Jesus entered his ministry, he began to work through various miracles, turning water to wine, opening the eyes of the blind, healing sick people, raising the dead. Jesus' teachings, they were amazing. They were packed with authority. Jesus was different than all the other religious leaders of his day. Many people were getting very excited by what they saw and what they heard, expecting Jesus to rise to power, thinking that he could actually be the great Messiah they had heard all about growing up. Jesus was becoming very popular with the people. And the time came for Jesus to go up into Jerusalem to fulfill his calling. Now, a lot of the people that were following him didn't realize what exactly his calling was. Would he step out of his lowly position and find a sword with a great, a great gleaming white horse and ride triumphantly into Jerusalem with sword drawn? Would he and his disciples ride in as a force and uh, finally begin to establish the physical kingdom of Israel and overthrow those Romans who are oppressing them so greatly? Well, Luke reveals what took place. Luke chapter 19, 29 to 40. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and there enter it, and you'll find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. 
Those who were sent went ahead and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. So they brought it to Jesus, and they threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to joyfully praise God in loud voices for all of the miracles that they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, they shouted. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus said this, he said, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. So here's Jesus coming into Jerusalem. And he didn't do what a great king would normally do. Rather than riding into Jerusalem on a white stallion, which, which by the way, one day he will do, but that day comes later. Jesus appeared on the scene riding on a donkey's colt. And the disciples saw before their very eyes the fulfillment of the messianic prophecy in Zechariah chapter 9. As Jesus was riding into Jerusalem, there were joyful praises going up before God with loud voices because they believed in him, having seen all of the miraculous signs that Jesus had shown to them. And the people shouted, Blessed be the King! who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. But as they were doing this, the religious leaders, the people who held the power in the land of Israel that that were watching, upon hearing what the disciples were shouting, were telling Jesus to rebuke his disciples and tell them to be quiet. See, these these Pharisees, These leaders of Israel's religious system were not happy to see the people praising God and calling Jesus king. In fact, they were jealous of him for this. And he was not at all what they were thinking the Messiah should be. No, this Jesus, he was lowly and humble. He was not at all like the king that they wanted him to be. They were excited about the Messiah who might bring... uh, he might, he might establish an empire that would make Israel the dominant military power in the world. They wanted their king to be a mighty military champion like his forefather David was. Remember that scripture that said, Saul is slain as thousand and David is ten thousands? Well, David was a great military leader and they wanted a Messiah much the same way as the military leader of of the figurehead of David, who they believed would overthrow the the Romans' tyranny. And who was this fellow that came riding into the city of Jerusalem, being proclaimed king, riding on a little donkey? The idea of this victorious conquering king entering the city you know, see, this was burned into the consciousness of a lot of the people. You know, throughout the times where Egypt and per- Persia and Greece and Rome and Babylon, these empires would reign and when they, when, they, when they overcame a city, they would come home and uh, they'd be escorted by the citizens of the kingdom and, and the army. And, and as that king entered the city, Songs were sung and praise was, was given to the conqueror. And he came with symbols of his victory and the authority of his battle, symbols of his authority in the battle. And uh, then he'd go to the temple of the city and, and make a special offering to the God in whom he believed granted him the victory. What, see, Jesus didn't do this. Um, what they didn't realize is that Jesus was coming to establish a kingdom, all right? But it was a kingdom that was not of this physical world. It was a kingdom that would be everlasting, at least in the inception of the kingdom. You see, one day Jesus will establish a kingdom and a rule 
physically on the earth. He's going to overthrow the evil. But in this kingdom that was conceived, it was not a kingdom of this world. And Jesus was coming to fulfill the law of Moses and establish a new covenant by his own blood. The kingdom he would establish would be established not in the physical sense as a physical castle and, uh, and, and buildings made of stone or wood. No, th this kingdom would be established in the hearts of the people himself with them. Now Jesus, he entered Jerusalem with this humble escort accompanied by praising God and singing. And the only symbols of his power, think about this, were um, a humble donkey and palm branches. And upon entering the, the city, he didn't go to offer sacrifices, but after he entered the city, he went to the temple. And what did he do there? He challenged the religious status quo and confronted the corruption in the Jewish temple. And this just made the present leaders of Jerusalem and the leaders of the, the religious orders of the Jews infuriated. Commenter Adam Clark says, this entry into Jerusalem has been termed the triumph of Christ. It was indeed a triumph of humility over pride and worldly grandeur, of poverty over affluence and meekness and gentleness over rage and malice. See, what the triumphal entry of Christ really means is that Easter is coming. Jesus was readying the way to establish his kingdom at the time of the Jewish Passover feast. The Lord knew that this was going to be ushering in a new covenant. It, signify, it, it signifies a new order being established. And it's significant that his disciples cried out, peace in heaven rather than peace on earth. See, there wasn't going to be peace on earth because the Prince of Peace was going to be rejected and was soon to be slain. The peace on earth will happen later when Christ returns, but this time was not peace on earth. There would be peace in heaven as a result of the soon coming crucifixion of Jesus at Calvary and his resurrection from the dead. But this isn't what um, this wasn't what was, was on the forefront of the minds of the people. The, the Pharisees were indignant and they were jealous. Um, telling Jesus' followers to stop singing praises. And Jesus, his answer was, was such as if to say that the hard rocks of this ground were softer than the Pharisees' hardened hearts. And if the people stopped singing praises, this was a prophecy being fulfilled. You see, they weren't going to stop. And if they did stop, the rocks themselves would cry out if the people didn't. After hearing this from the unbelieving Pharisees, Jesus continued on his walk towards Jerusalem. And he looked at Jerusalem and a tear filled his eyes. And he began to weep. He knew that he was going to his God-ordained destination, which was the cross. And we read in Luke chapter 19, 41 to 44 in the New Living Translation. But as Jesus came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. How I wish today that you people would understand the way to peace. But now it's too late and peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close you in from every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. So Jesus sees Jerusalem and he weeps. Predicting the destruction of the city, his heart was moved to sorrow because he knows that he will be rejected by so many and that he was going to Calvary to die as God's sacrifice for their sins along with the sins of the entire world, but they would not see it for what it was. 
Jesus knew that many of the inhabitants of Jerusalem would choose to follow their own wicked hearts to destruction and be lost rather than to the truth, his truth, and be saved. He knew that they wouldn't recognize him for who he was, and this caused him great sorrow. Did you know God's heart weeps for those who reject him? God is not pleased when people are visited by him and they choose not to acknowledge him. He's actually moved to sorrow when the world rejects the word of his gospel. It's given as a free gift, pointing people towards peace. And they choose to follow their own wicked hearts to destruction instead of embracing his peace. Oh man, like the destruction that would come to the Jews who rejected Jesus in AD 70, which is when the Romans laid siege to the city and toppled every stone of the temple off of the other stones. It was completely laid bare. The Lord's heart is stirred with sorrow when he sees, likewise, the masses of humanity pushing away from his free gift of salvation because they have not recognized the Holy Spirit of God directly speaking to them and telling them to be reconciled to God by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, the sacrificial lamb of God, who has the power to take away the sin of the whole world, is despised and rejected by so many and God weeps. See, Jesus marched towards Jerusalem and his marching was signifying his willingness to be led like a lamb to the slaughter for all of our sins. The sad, rem the sa sad reminder and the reality is that so many people hear this message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And like the Jews of old, they put blinders on and want Jesus to be a different kind of Jesus, a Jesus of their own making, a Jesus that will be rising up like a military leader who will take their Roman-like oppressive circumstances and sweep them away with all of the troubles of their life and free them from the troubles in this physical realm. You see, so many people won't believe in Jesus because they want Jesus to be like a genie in a bottle who immediately grants them all of their wishes. They don't want to follow him and serve him unless he does exactly what they want. But the Apostle Paul makes it very clear that the kingdom of God is not a matter of physical things in this world. So many people and even Christians get led astray by thinking that the kingdom of God here and now is all about the things of this world. It's not. Romans 14.7 says this, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. You see, the things of this world pass away, but the word of God and the righteousness of God and the peace of God and the joy in the Holy Spirit of God never pass away. The fact is that Jesus told his disciples that the just shall live by faith. Jesus came to build a spiritual kingdom in the hearts of people through which people can only access by having faith in him. God does this to prepare them for the day when he will in fact establish a real physical kingdom that will never spoil, perish, or fade. See, as Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness, in the same manner when we believe Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away our sin, when we truly believe our sins are washed away by God's grace, and we are saved through faith. The Holy Spirit moves inside of us and we partake in the divine nature with a harvest of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is within. And none of this can be obtained from the things of this world, the pleasures of this world, the possessions of this world, the hobbies of this world. Nothing can satisfy the heart of man except for God's water of life that he deposits in us when we believe in the Holy Spirit. When we believe in Jesus, the Holy Spirit 
comes into us and gives us water in our spirit that satisfies our thirst. We partake with Him. And that's not of this world. If we will only answer the call of the Holy Spirit to believe in Jesus and with our mouth confess that He is Lord, then God reconciles us to Himself when we're on our own. We're lost in the darkness and our sins separate us from God. But in Jesus, God reconciles us to Himself and makes it just as if we had never sinned. He grants us new life, everlasting life. Those who acknowledge Jesus in this way will be clothed in the robe of righteousness that Jesus Christ will give him. And you see, there is a day coming, like a thief in the night, where the Lord himself will come to collect his saints. A trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then those who are alive and remain on the earth as his will be caught up together with him in the clouds and he will usher them into his everlasting presence. And we will be with the Lord forever, with eternal life being granted. That day will come, my friends. But that day will also be a day of sorrow for the earth because they will face the wrath of God and the wickedness that has been born on the earth and that flourishes on the earth will be dealt with under the judgment of God. Just like destruction came upon the majority of the Jews in AD 70 because they didn't recognize it when the Lord their God visited them. Suddenly judgment and destruction will come upon the earth and all who refuse to acknowledge Jesus Christ as God visiting them. Severe punishment and judgment will come upon the world and it will come suddenly like a plague without escape. God will deal with the wickedness of this world but this being said my friends like Jesus was filled with the sorrow when he saw the many people in Jerusalem that would be lost because they refused to acknowledge the truth. So God is filled with sorrow when he sees the world in its state of rebellion and the people of the world who reject him because they do not understand the way of peace that he offers. But the prophet Joel cried out to the people of Israel in Joel 2.13, Rend your hearts! and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and He relents from sending calamity. See, so the Lord Jesus Christ calls out to the people of the earth in a similar manner through the message of His apostles, which which we can summarize in 2 Corinthians 5, 19-21 that God himself was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's trespasses against them. And he has committed to us this message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God was making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Furthermore, it's written by the Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter 1, 19 and 20. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, that's Jesus Christ, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on the earth or things in heaven, by making peace through, his, through the blood of his cross. Do you hear the weeping of the Lord for you because you've resisted the Holy Spirit today? You're traveling the road to destruction if you refuse to acknowledge the Lordship of Christ over your life. I'm here to say today that it doesn't have to be so. You can be our partaker in the divine nature You can have the peace of God inside your spirit. You can have reconciliation to a relationship that is right with God 
by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm here to invite you today to turn away. If you've, if you've, if you've pushed away from the table of Jesus in the past, it's not too late for you to be reconciled. Turn away from your wickedness and the things that you hold as precious when they are not. Turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and repent of your sins and ask Him to be your Savior and ask Him to be your, your King, your Lord. And if you believe in your heart and you, res- and, and you confess the Lord Jesus Christ with your mouth, if you truly believe, the Bible says that you will be saved. You will be saved from the times in the future where God's judgment will be poured out on the earth. You'll be saved from eternal damnation. God's not desiring that any should perish. He weeps for that, but that all should come to repentance. Receive the free gift of Jesus Christ and eternal life by placing your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord, you know the hearts of people that are out there today. And God, for the Christians, I pray that you would encourage them this Palm Sunday, that they are in your hand, that you love them, and that you're taking care of them. And that one day, Lord, you're going to come for them. The trumpet will sound and we'll be gathered to you. What a blessed, glorious day that will be when we shall see you face to face, Lord Jesus. When we look upon you, Lord, and we realize that you are, you are giving us eternal life. What a blessed day that's going to be, Lord Jesus, when you give us new bodies that will never spoil or fade away. No more pain, no more suffering, none of that, for the old order will be passed away and all things will be made new. And Lord, for those that are out there today that have never asked you to be their Savior, I I just pray, Jesus, right now that you you would just show them that they can come to you and all they need to do is repent Turn away from the way that we're going, they were going. Repent and turn to you, Lord Jesus, and ask you to be their Savior and confess that you are now their Lord. And if they do this, they will be saved. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you today. If you've prayed that prayer where you've asked Jesus to be your Savior, please call me at Hillside Community Church or find another Christian that you know walks with God and ask them to help you starting out on your new journey of faith. God bless you. I, I look forward to seeing you next Sunday on Easter. Amen.